which they saved on money by, um, I guess they were using lighter bolts and fewer of them. And they just had these, I guess, you know, electric wrenches that would tighten them really tight to this precise mm -hmm. tension. Yep. And that way it compensated for everything else. Yep, definitely. Uh, what else? You know, what, what kind of other things do you, do you think a, uh, a processor will be useful? Do you think a, shop, a pencil sharpener can use a processor? Okay. What, what do you think will be useful? Why do you think a pencil sharpener will be useful when a processor is in it? What, what kind of value does it add? So it doesn't just keep on going so the pencil is really small. Yep. Mm -hmm. You can certainly do that. When it sees it sharp, it just stops. Yep. Yep, you can certainly do that. Sorry? To recognize whether the pencil is in there. Whether it's a pencil or a finger? Yeah. Or no, it's just recognize whether the pencil is even in there. Right. Or it has that motion sensor. Or you can detect whether it's a pencil or a finger, you know, in case you're going, you know, in case you have a pencil sharpener in kindergarten, if you can distinguish between a finger and a pencil, that can be a safety you know, feature. Okay. So yes, so we can write software, you know, on just about any thing, you know, because you know these MCUs are so inexpensive, you can put one on just about anything that you can think of. How about your backpack? Do you think your backpack can become "quote unquote" intelligent in a way that is useful? Well, I can do better. How about you know telling you that somebody is approaching you at a high speed from behind? <laughs> it can do it. I mean, the you know, motion sensing is not that difficult. The electronics to do motion sensing is not that much. It's not that difficult. Uh, you can sense you know someone who is approaching you. You can sense someone who's standing very close to you, and your backpack can give you some warning. You can you can need a beep. It can give you a blink or something like that. Okay. Um, you can also have a sensor to tell you that your zipper, you know, the zipper of the backpack is open when you lift it. Okay, so it can tell you, okay, wait, you know, this is probably not a good thing. You know, close the zipper first. Okay. So we are talking about software for just about anything. I mean, you know, I, I don't think you know I can you know spend a class or two to enumerate all the things that can use you know software. So here we are going to describe you know, how developers and computer scientists relate to some other people in a related field. Electrical and computer engineers are the ones, you know, are the people who are responsible for the research, design, and implementation of the hardware components of a computer. Okay? So when you go to Intel, when you go to AMD, the people who design the processors, they are either electrical engineers or they are computer engineers. Okay, they are in the, in the field of engineering for the hardware components. When you go to Microsoft, when you go to Oracle, the, those software companies, then you will start to see developers. Developer is basically the same name you know, for programmers, coders, and so on. But we try to go away or step away from the name developer these days, and we want to use software engineers instead of developers. Okay, they're slightly, they're similar in meaning, but not exactly the same. And these people are very, very important in any software company. And there are also other people involved in software development. And we'll just take a quick look at you know these other people. Um, the first one is a systems analyst. The second one, the you know, developers, which is you know the main point of this whole slide. And the last one will be the people who are responsible to do testing. So I'm just giving you guys a view of all the other people who are related to people who write software. Okay. Let's think about, okay, instead of reading my notes, let's think about that you're building a house. You found a piece of land that is really nice. Okay, you know, you found a piece of a land that is next to a cliff, you know, next to the ocean, has a really good view of everything, and you want to build a house. Okay, you want to build a house on this land. So what do you do? What kind of people, what kind of expertise do you think you will need to build that house? Architect. Okay, you need an architect first. Okay, what? Go ahead. Sorry? A soil analyst, okay, you know, or a civil engineer. Okay, in general, you know, a civil engineer can assess, you know, soil, 
um, conditions and you know they, they can do all the calculations. Okay, very good. So we have a civil engineer, an architect, and what else? Who else do you need? Yep. Electrical engineer. Electrical engineer. Electrical engineers. Build the electrical um, contractors. Okay, you're talking about contractors. You know who actually build a house itself, you know, lay out the electrical stuff. You know, they are generally just, we just call those, you know, contractors, okay? All right, very good. So with those roles, let's see how they map into, you know, software, you know, software career. A systems analyst is basically playing two roles at, you know, with one person. They are both the architects and also the civil engineers, okay? Can anyone tell me what are the differences between a an architect and a soft and an architect versus a civil engineer? What kind of jobs do they do, and why are they different? Mm -hmm. The uh, architect kind of designs it. Mm -hmm. The civil engineer is more of the uh, the troubleshooter kind of test integrity. Make sure that thing you know does not fall down all by itself, right? Okay, very good. So the architect is the person who will ask the questions like, okay, well, you know, what do you think, you know, you want from this house, you know, as the owner of this house, okay? I want a really nice, you know, open view, maybe 180 degree view of the ocean, okay? Um, I want to have, you know, like two or three stories, okay? I want the first story to be the, the kitchen, the living room, the second story to be the living quarters, and then maybe the third one, to be, you know, I don't know, an observatory or something like that, okay? So that would be the job of an architect is to collect the input from the client, okay? What do you want out of this house, okay? What are your requirements, okay? And then the architect, based on these input, will, you know, draw up something, will, will draw a blueprint, okay? And the blueprint will have all the features that the customer requests, okay? Two or three stories with a nice view and so on and so forth. And let's say the customer says, you know, I also want this building to be overhanging the cliff, okay? I don't want it to be behind the cliff. I want the house to extend over the cliff just a little bit. So, you know, when people walk out, you know, I can have a plexiglass platform so people will be just kind of like walking in midair and they can see the ocean under them and so on and so forth. And the architect can, can all do all this. The next job would be the civil engineer's job, okay? Because the civil engineer, we we'll have to go through the design, go you know, test the soil type, test a lot of different things, and say, well, I don't know about that, you know, because according to my calculations, the soil type here is not going to be able to support your house. Okay, if you try to extend it out of the cliff. Okay, and that and that's also the job of a systems analyst in this case. So the soft, the, the system analyst has two roles to play. One is to design the system. And the next one is to make sure it is feasible. It can actually be done. When the systems analyst is all done, they will have come up with the blueprint of the computer system. In other words, it, it is equivalent to the blueprint of a house. Okay? So what is the next stage of building a house? Once you have a blueprint, the civil engineer has approved because you know, all the calculations work out. And the customer says, okay, well, looking at the 3D model, I think this is exactly what I want. So what is the next stage? Contractors. To build contractors to build a house. Very good. Now, why can't we just say you know, to the architect and the civil engineer and say, well, I like you guys you know, a lot. Why don't you guys build a house for me? That's not their job. It's not their job. <coughs> they, don't know how. they don't know how. Very good. Okay. But, but I can trust you guys, you know, I, you, you, I can pay you, you know, the salary of an architect and the salary of a civil engineer, and I can, you know, even, you know, pay you all the tools and whatnot, you know, I want you to build a house for me. Why is that not such a, such a good idea? It's not their profession. It's not, what they it's not their profession. Very good. Yep. So since it's too expensive, it's cheaper to pay someone else to build it. Exactly. Yeah, but let, even if we say that you know, expense is you know the, the cost is not an issue, it will still not be a very good idea. So what I want to do now is to go to the developer slide because there are certain things about being a developer that prevents the same person of being a systems analyst. Okay. 
So the question is, you know, why don't the software analysts write their own programs? Why do they you know, pass on the blueprint to somebody else when they already have a good idea of what the system is supposed to do and how to configure the system? So as it turns out, software development or programming in general has a, is a process that requires some special talents and skills. There are several major challenges when you write programs. The first one, which is not really a big deal, is the grammar of programming languages. In other words, when do I use square brackets? When do I use commas? When do I use semicolons? When do I use colons? When do I put a space in between something? And what characters, what letters can I use in a name, and so on and so forth. Okay, the grammar of a programming language are all of those rules. Okay. Some people find it difficult to learn, and other people find it easy. You know, when it is all rule-based. The point is, the syntax of programming languages must be exact. Okay, if you miss a comma, the program is not going to work. If you forget to close a parenthesis, the program is not going to work. If you use a comma instead of a semicolon, the program is not going to work. Okay. Okay, that's one challenge, but not really a big one. The second one is programming logic. A systems analyst has to work with high-level logic that can be represented by diagrams, flowcharts, and stuff like that. At a program level, a developer has to pay attention to a lot of details, lots and lots of details. And that's why when you write a program, you need to have extended periods of highly focused attention to logic. <coughs> Think of it like this. Okay, you know, someone who is you know, designing the overall thing is just you know, sketching a picture. But when you're actually building it out of Lego pieces, well, you know, I guess you have a lot more to consider. Okay, you have to think about what, uh, what, what is the next piece of Lego you need in order to build that something that someone just kind of sketches in a picture. And that's why programmers do not like interrupt interruptions. Okay? When you are writing a program, you don't want any phone calls. You don't want people to walk into your office to ask you questions. You don't want distractions because any one of those distractions will basically disrupt your train of thought and you will need a lot of time to reestablish the context of programming at that point. I think the most difficult part of being a programmer is debugging. A systems analyst does not need to debug. Okay, a systems analyst only has to say, well, the program has to work this way. Okay? But what if the program does not behave the way it's supposed to? A systems analyst will just say, it's not my job. You know, I don't know who's going to fix it, but it's not my job. Right? But the programmer has to deal with it. Okay? So what is debugging? Debugging, okay, let me just go back to here. Most programs do not work right the first time. And some programs never work right. <clears throat> Software development is an iterative process that involves thinking, okay, planning, how do I do something like that, coding, actually putting it into a programming language, testing it, making sure that it does work or not, and debugging it. Debugging is to basically look at a program. You know that the program is not working the way it's supposed to. You have to find out why it is not, and two, you have to fix it. Okay? And that is actually something that most people, even programmers, do not like the debugging process. They don't like to debug programs because it is very time consuming and a lot of times it's like playing detective. How many people have tried to diagnose problems with your cars? Your car won't start up in the morning. Okay? Do you enjoy that process? <laughs> If you enjoy that process, you'll make a good programmer because programmers, you know, typically has to do with the same thing, except you don't get your hands greasy and oily. Sorry. I enjoy time 